and three, two, one. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to this week's episode of the Tesla Geek Show. I'm Eli. And I'm Anwar Beck. The big talk is battery day. We don't know when it is, but that's all everybody's talking about in the Tesla community. So this week we have a special guest, a battery supply chain expert. Uh, we're going to bring this guy on here a little bit and talk batteries. So this week's episode of the Tesla Geek Show is sponsored by our very good friend at Evanex. Matt and his dad, who were the founders and creators of Evanex, they're great guys, members of the Tesla community from the very beginning. We highly recommend if you need any accessories for your Tesla, check them out because they are the Tesla community's accessory store. All right, all right, Anwar Beck, it's time to bring on our guest. We are so excited about this guest. We didn't even tell you who this person was because this person needs to introduce themselves. Vavas, welcome to the Tesla Geek Show. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, it's man. Good to be so, here. high level, let me explain where we all met, first of all. <clears throat> so, Vivas at Tesla, used to work for Tesla, was the uh, uh, senior manager of the supply chain. So, this is definitely the, the right battery guy that we're talking to. But actually, all three of us met uh, months ago. Uh, oh, there it is. Yeah, we met at uh, Fully Charged at Circuit of Americas. And what's crazy is we like we we kind of knew of each other in our panels. We ended up speaking on panels that were back to back. So we kind of linked up. Vivas, Eli, and I had a conversation, and he blew our mind with the things that he's been, you know, the things that he's done. And uh, so we thought at some point we gotta bring this guy on to tell his story, to like teach us in the community about battery supply chain, especially when it comes to Tesla. So welcome to the podcast, man. I'm so glad you're finally on. We're I'm glad to, to finally be on too. So Vavas, tell us, tell us your background. Tell it like ex explain to everyone in the audience why you're here today and all the things you're going to speak about, about how you're the guy who can really answer these questions. Yeah, absolutely. So just like Anwar Beck said, I used to be responsible for sourcing some of the battery chain over at Tesla. I left Tesla about a year ago. And the reason I left was to go get an MBA at Stanford, which is what I'm doing now. Concurrently to that, I'm also a principal at a company called Benchmark Mineral Intelligence, which is a company that's completely focused on the lithium ion battery supply chain. And they do data and research and consultancy type work, looking at all the major players throughout this very interesting supply chain that is core to electric vehicles. And before that, I was an engineer. I've been an electrical engineer for many, many years. So the interest in batteries goes far beyond the, the time that I spent at Tesla. It's been something I've been cultivating for over a decade now. So of what you can and you're allowed to tell us, when you say you do battery supply chain at Tesla, explain to us in the audience, like, what does that mean? So you like, what was the scope of your, of your role doing battery supply chain? The scope of my role was I was sourcing <laughs> the materials that were used to make batteries. So lithium, nickel, cobalt, graphite, I'm assuming those are the main minerals? Yeah, absolutely. When you look at a battery, there's over a hundred different parts that are used to make a battery. And so some of the most well-known ones are the ones that you're saying, lithium, nickel, cobalt, graphite, etc. I was part of a broader team and our team was responsible for going out and sourcing all of these parts. And then at that point, cell manufacturing at the Gigafactory would take over. So it was a great job. I had a lot of fun doing it, and I love the industry so much that even when I decided to go to Stanford and get further educated, I, I needed to still keep a foot in the industry through my yeah, yeah. current work with Benchmark. That's why it's so interesting. Vivas has a lot of experience with Tesla, clearly, but now that he's working with Benchmark, he's familiar with what's going on with other uh, OEMs. I mean, there's this EV revolution isn't just – Tesla is kind of the epicenter of it, I feel like, and a front runner, but definitely. But there are a lot, there's a lot going on outside of just Tesla as well. So that's why I think you're a very, you've got a very interesting perspective. Like you clearly understand what's going on from the Tesla front and what Tesla's been doing. And we'll definitely dive into that. But I also, by the end of this podcast, really want to understand the global, like what's going on with everybody. I mean, we got the, the Ford uh, Mach-E or whatever, Audi e-tron. There's a, everybody's announced that they're going fully electric over the next five, 10 years. 
Um, so yeah, and my question and the question is everyone's announced are going electric. The question is, how do they get there? And I'll say, I'm excited to learn about this on this episode. I think as much as the audience, because the one thing we never really hear about is the back end logistics of how these things get made. And I would say to a large extent, this is something that traditional media and even media in general doesn't even know what to look for, right? Because mm -hmm. this is a completely different type of supply chain when you're having to use bare natural resources and a very finite numbers of ones to produce the energy source. Unlike engines, you're using pretty standard metals and materials that are in large supply. So I'm super excited to get into this whole process. Anything else that we should know about your background before we start grilling you? I think what's really interesting, and this is just a fun fact, you know, my parents have been in the oil industry for 40 years, and it made sense wow. for them because, I mean, those were the opportunities that were available when they were, you know, when they were trying. And now they're both Tesla owners, and they are the wow. most hardcore Tesla fans that I knew before I went and got a job at Tesla and met the employees and met you guys. So, you know, it is possible. It, it is very possible, as we've seen, for people to change their tune over time. That's amazing. So what? I mean, do you that's have Anwar. Like you know Anwar Beck's story, right? He was a former yeah, oil and yeah, gas yeah, executive, so like right in that store, like the same thing. Anwar Beck and I connected because we both got Houston roots. Yep. Yeah. So you you went to Rice as well, right? That's your I went undergraduate. To Rice. Yeah. That's so the, what what did you? Wearing. Electrical electrical engineering and computer science, <clears throat> or computer Just engineering. engineering. Electrical engineer. Okay. So what oh, I'm curious, like you're hot and heavy in the <clears throat> EV mining space right now. <clears throat> it was there a moment where you kind of like, I guess being double E, it's pretty obvious that you're heading that direction, but why, why EVs? Why this space? Why Tesla? When did that like solidify in your mind? Was it right after college or beforehand? Were you obsessed with cars at any one point? Like, how did you end up here? I was like, it was, it was never about, it was never about the car. To be frank, I, I'm definitely afraid of driving. I get a lot of anxiety when driving. So obviously autopilot has done wonders for me. For me, it was, it was always about the potential that batteries had to change the way in which energy was stored and, and consumed at a grid level and by vehicles. And that's really what drew me to, to working at Tesla. To be frank, I, I applied multiple times before I finally got an interview. Yeah, uh, yeah. But then once I did, you know, it, it kind of went from there. Did you, so did I got to like, add a comment real quick, Vavas. Yeah, yeah. I am actually the same way with driving. I did refuse to get my license until the age of 18, even though my parents yeah. were like, hurry up and get it in 16. And I never liked the process of driving. It causes me a massive amount of anxiety because how many things you need to pay attention to, to actually have control of your place in the road. Cause like as much as it can be used to be looking in front of you, if you want to actually have control of your environment, you have to be looking at everything happening next to you and behind you. Yep. And to do that, like do that OODA loop thing where you're actually scanning everywhere every 10 seconds is exhausting. But that's yep. the only way that I could drive and feel comfortable. And then autopilot came out and all of a sudden I could actually enjoy the roads so much so that I now run an owner's club called My Tesla Adventure. But yeah, literally Tesla changed my life and I had this adventurous spirit that I couldn't execute on because the whole driving process was actually really not fun for me at all. Mm -hmm. Vas, do you remember when you first heard about Tesla or what got you in the Tesla? When I first heard about Tesla, it was, it was probably Model S reveal. And mm -hmm. gosh, it's been like almost 10 years. I remember mm -hmm. seeing the red Model S for the first time and thinking like, wow, this is a beautiful car. Mm -hmm. And just started following the, the news back then. And then, Every single time a new development came up, it was just more and more exciting. Mm -hmm. So back in you know, 2013, I applied, 2014, I applied, 2015, I applied, 2016, I applied, and finally it worked out. Yeah. So, you, uh, so when you went to Tesla, you were a program manager for the supply, supply chain and automation department when you first mm -hmm. started, correct? Did yeah, you... so that was, that was a good entry into Tesla, learned a lot, mm -hmm. and then an opportunity to work on batteries came up, so I took it. That's awesome. So, uh, Eli, do you have any questions before? Because I think I feel like we, we've gotten a background on the boss. Now we can dive in. My main question to kind of like segue into the next portion of this is I'm like, a, I, I feel like middle of the bell shaped curve, like a typical Tesla owner. 
The only thing I've ever done that's maybe a little bit unusual is I've actually taken a, uh, I think it was an 18650 cell with some of my friends and I geeked out one day, took a Dremel to it and cut it open and all that. So I kind of can visualize what's inside the battery cells and all that. But when it comes to the full supply chain, I have zero clue how the batteries in my Model 3 or the batteries in Eli's P100D Raven end up there. We just, we go and like order the cars online and then they show up you know, at the, at the service center, we just go pick them up and then we enjoy the car. But as far as the full supply chain, I'm talking like the raw materials, where they come from all the way to where they're, I guess, in, uh, at the gigafactory when they're all put into the cell packs and all that kind of stuff. Can you kind of at a high level wa walk us through that? And then Eli and I can continue to ask questions. Absolutely. And, and you know, everything I'm saying is, is relevant for batteries across the board. It's true for batteries that are in your iPhone. It's true for batteries that you put into your TV remote control, as it is true for, for what you put in a vehicle as well, mm -hmm. whether that be Tesla or anybody else. Okay. So basically batteries have a cathode and an anode. And electricity is through the movement of electrons back and forth between the cathode and the anode. Mm -hmm. In order to make a battery cell, you need, like I said earlier, dozens and dozens of parts in order to make that. Now, what's important to note also is, even though they're called lithium ion batteries, it's obviously not just about lithium. Mm -hmm. Other materials, especially things like nickel and cobalt and aluminum and graphite, play a huge role in the manufacturing. And Real quick, why did they get the name lithium ion? Because the way in which the battery uh, charges and discharges is based on the movement of lithium ions within the battery cell. So that's the reason why they're called lithium ion. Oh. But, you know, four or five years ago, Elon made this public comment where he said, well, they really should be called nickel graphite batteries. And I actually I agree with that. that. <clears throat> yeah. And what he meant when he, when he went out and publicly said that was, we're talking about how it's about the movement of electrons between the cathode and the anode. Well, what's the majority material of a cathode is nickel. What's the majority material of an anode? It's graphite. That's true today. That may not be true five years from now, but... The amount of nickel, the amount of graphite, the amount of cobalt, aluminum, like these materials can't be disregarded. And they're just as important as the lithium part. So anyway, going back to your question of how exactly does this stuff get into the batteries? It's not like the material just comes out of a mine and goes straight into a battery. There's a lot of steps in the middle. So material comes out of a mine and then it gets made into these specialty chemicals. So high quality chemicals that can only be used for battery manufacturing. And then it goes through multiple steps of making more and more high quality chemicals before they're ultimately put into a cathode or an anode. And then the cathode and anode and a couple of other parts are mixed together and made into a battery cell. So that's kind of a high level simplistic way to think about it. So it's a very like the lithium, nickel, cobalt, the, the elements that we're familiar with, you're saying that the grade of it has to be pretty premium. Like this isn't, you're not talking bottom of the barrel. This is like top of the barrel, like, and I'm assuming that also means it's expensive. Where, where, maybe take lithium as an example. That might be the easiest way to go through this. Just high level, where does it start? Where are most of these lithium deposits? Like in the beginning, I'm assuming it starts in a mine somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, everything basically starts in a mine, right? Like that, that's the joke in the mining industry is mining is the mother of all industries because everything some, from some place comes from a mine. Mm -hmm. Most of the lithium in the world can be found in two distinct regions. It can either be through a hard rock mine in Australia, and it could be through brine ponds, which are in a, a place in South America called the Lithium Triangle, which encompasses Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile. Okay. There are other places in the world that have meaningful quantities of lithium, China, uh, Brazil. But as of today, in terms of who produces the most for consumption, it would be those two distinct regions. Okay. And once again, like, you know, for nickel, for cobalt, for aluminum, we can point out specific countries where these materials are available in large quantities. So the lesson there is that lithium, you know, it, it's everywhere in the world. But the question is, where is it in meaningful quantities? Meaningful quantities enough to where it makes sense to actually extract them and build an industry around them. And based on today's technology, those are the two places that make sense. And hopefully technology keeps improving so that we can keep opening up new sources around the world. 
Okay, so so step one, the it's basically Latin America, that, that lithium triangle you're talking about, Chile, Argentina, B- Bolivia. Yep. And then you said Australia as well. So once those, uh, and the, you mentioned two different hard rock and then the like the, the water base, the brine base one, right? Yep. So that's how you guys collect the raw material. So then after that, what's the second step? Where do these things go? I'm assuming yeah, it's like a so- chemical treating type process of some sort. So basically, let's let's take the the South American example, right? So when I say what I'm saying is you're basically pumping out salty groundwater, and in that groundwater is multiple different types of salts. So they don't just have lithium; they also have potassium salts, they have magnesium salts, and so the next step is the process of separating out the lithium from all the other types of salts. And then you can take the lithium salt, for lack of an easier way of saying it, the lithium salt, and then concentrate it to being of that high quality that you would need in order to make the battery cells. Oh, okay. Okay, that makes sense. So then, um, I guess next step, uh, is it, where where do these raw materials go from from those regions of the world? Mm. So most of the manufacturing of the intermediate chemical steps for the whole battery supply chain in the world actually happens today in China for lithium. The USA also has a lot of chemicals manufacturing, but China is far and away. It happens at different concentrations for all the major battery in terms of where in the world they're made into specialty chemicals, but far and away, China is the place where a lot of this stuff happens in the batteries. And so once it's made into quality specialty chemical, then it gets sent wherever else in the world it needs to be sent in order to be made into cathodes and anodes and then ultimately batteries and then cars. I remember uh, just to put it in like our listeners perspective. So whenever, just to get back to whenever we cu- cut open the casing, um, I think it's in uh, Eli in, in, in Tesla's they're made out of aluminum, right? The exterior casing. I believe that's correct. Yeah, so we we took that, my friends and I, we took a Dremel to it, and then the inside of it is basically, uh, it's it's kind of like Kodak film, right? So so basically, I saw four layers. Vivas, maybe like you can explain this. Like when we took it out, there's one, I guess, the positive layer, um, the cation, and then on top of that, there's a layer that was like film, and then and then there's like a graphite layer. I'm assuming that was the negative layer. And then, and I think the graphite is maybe the one mixed in with lithium, but then there's another layer and all of it kind of gets rolled up into almost like a, uh, like a, uh, a Kodak film and then put it into that little aluminum container. Yeah. The, the, the very technical term for that and is the jelly roll. Jelly roll. Okay. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, no, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Like, and what you're saying is, is exactly that point of all of these materials are blended together and they all kind of stack up on top of each other in what looks like a very simple battery cell. But on the inside, there's billions of chemicals, chemical reactions going on in, every, in any given second in order to make these electrons move to generate that electricity that we all need. Um, Eli, what's the next question? So where do they go from there? So where do they go from there? So we talked about how you make battery cells. And if you look at, let's say you're a Tesla, right? The battery pack is just thousands of cells made into a pack. So there will never ever be one cell that is strong enough to power a whole car. You're going to need multiple different cells to do it. So then at that point, that's just a, a mechanical process of stringing together as many cells as possible that's needed to to meet the requirement. Okay, so we're in China, the chemical treating process, but by this time, these are like the very high grade chemicals, right? It's like ready for the battery making process. So where's the next step from there? Yeah, and then after that, whomever in the world wants batteries will take these high quality chemicals Mm -hmm. and convert them into either cathodes or anodes and mm-hmm. that stuff happens all over the world, depending on, on where whomever's making the battery cells wants them to get made. Mm-hmm. And then the cathodes and the anodes are put together and made into a battery cell. 
And then the cells, if you're a car maker, you would take the cells and you make them into packs by just taking a bunch of cells, sticking them all together. And then the pack is what goes in the vehicle. So for every different car company, this all happens in different places in the world. Okay. And also, um, from what I understand, what I know about uh, batteries is like the cylindrical cells, but there's many other types of ways you can put this stuff together. Can you kind yeah. of explain to our listeners generally what are the different types of uh, like the way you package batteries together? The game for batteries is that it is the ultimate engine optimization exercise. So you could look at basically every single metric related to making battery cells. So the height, the circumference, uh, the actual quality of the materials that are used, whether you use an NCA or an NCM for the cathode, whether you use graphite or lithium for the anode, whether you use cylindrical or pouch. I mean, I can just keep going on and on. And all of these trade-offs, you can optimize around them to get certain performance that you want. So for example, you're not gonna use the same battery cell in an electric vehicle that you're gonna use in your iPhone, right? Your iPhone has got like a little like dollar coin battery and it doesn't need nearly the high purity in terms of the materials that your electric vehicle would be using. You just said something very important that I have literally never thought about. Why is it that the iPhone doesn't need as high a purity as the electric vehicle? Because I'll be honest, as a consumer who really doesn't understand batteries, I would have just thought that they were the same thing, just of a different size. So what's the difference? What's different in the use case that requires them not to be as, require as high a purity? So before I jump into that, fun fact, in your Apple iPhone, there's actually more lithium in the screen than there is in the battery. No way. Yep. What? Yep. What? You know, I've never heard of a screen called a lithium screen, but they call them lithium batteries. All right. All right. You've got to break into this. What's the story here? <laughs> so imagine your iPhone, right? You charge it don't have to. every right day. In front of me. <laughs> well, yeah. So you charge it every day. You can charge it on the fly. You can put a, a case around it to charge it. And if this thing, if the battery just completely conks out, you can replace the battery cell and keep going. Why? Because what is the most important part of this iPhone? It's not the battery. The most important part of this iPhone is basically everything else, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. the, I would argue the screen is a much more important part of the iPhone than the battery. Mm -hmm. But you look at any electric vehicle, the battery is the engine of the electric vehicle. It is the most important part. It can't just be charged on the fly in the middle of the road. If that battery dies when you're driving down the middle of the street, you're in a lot of trouble. And like, Eli, you were telling me, man, you just got towed a couple of weeks ago, right? <laughs> I got towed a couple hours ago. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't even a couple of weeks ago. I was getting, I got towed three times in the last 24 hours. <laughs> exactly. And like, can you imagine, you've got a, you've got a special case, right? But like, <clears throat> I've been driving my Tesla for, you know, for months and months and months now, never had any issues with it because I rely on the battery to do fine. But I can't tell you the number of times I've like, look at my iPhone, it says 10% battery and then boom, it just dies all of a sudden. I would never accept that from an electric vehicle. Consumers anyway, no matter what electric vehicle they're buying, never accept that. So that's the reason why this high quality matters so much because when you're buying the car, you're buying the battery first. So what you're saying is the difference in quality of materials actually changes the reliability of the battery. Yes. Sounds so obvious, but I'd really never thought that much into it before. I mean, think about it like food, right? Like the, the difference of the quality of the ingredients that you use will affect the difference, will, will be the difference between a good meal and a great meal. So in this case, your battery is your meal and the ingredients are your lithium, your nickel, your cobalt, your cathode, your anode, et cetera. You want so, them to be a high quality so you can get a high quality battery. So one more question before you get back to the main topic. What is the difference when they say a high quality versus a low quality you know, material? What's the actual difference? Like what's the difference in the raw material, right? Cause like in theory, if you're putting in 5% nickel, it should be 5% nickel, but you're saying there's a difference in material quality. So what is, what is it that is actually fundamentally different? The from big a high difference quality is actually the, the impurities. So let's take this example that Emre Beck brought up earlier, which is you pump out this groundwater as brine, and within that brine, there's lithium and magnesium and potassium, for example. When you have your lithium salt separated, 
there will be some little amount of magnesium or little amount of potassium involved in that lithium solution. Okay, if it's a very, very tiny amount compared to the lithium that's there. But a low quality will have more magnesium or potassium than you would like as compared to the lithium that's in that, that's in that bag of lithium. So that extra it's, magnesium, potassium affects the reliability of the battery. When we talk about quality, we're not talking about necessarily making your lithium better. That's, I mean, a lithium molecule is a lithium molecule. What we're talking about is reducing the amount of other stuff that's in there. Got it. All right, and we're back. And, Bring this back and, to what this means for Tesla. Well, now, because I just now, got excited now, and geeked out for this a This is minute. awesome. This is awesome, dude. I'm so glad we have you on, dude. Because I've got so many questions. The other part of it, like back to what that Elon quote, what did he say? Uh, instead of calling it a lithium ion, you should call it nickel something? Yeah, he said at the time, you should call it a nickel graphite battery. Graphite. Is, does that mean there's like volume, volume wise or percentage wise, is there a lot more nickel in graphite? in our batteries than there are lithium and, and cobalt? Yeah, so once again, Elon made that comment because of the fact that the batteries that he is using, and the batteries that all of Tesla is using are driven by the use of nickel and graphite. Every company is doing something different. Every company has different proportions of all these different materials that they're using. So you could go to somebody, you now for example, your iPhone battery, doesn't use any nickel at all. It only uses lithium and cobalt and a bunch of other, you know, more minor materials. So they would look at that and they would say, well, you know, we don't really, we wouldn't call this a nickel graphite battery. We would call it a, a lithium cobalt battery, for example. So the key lesson over here is lithium ion is a catch all phrase, but there's a lot of diversity in, in terms of what a lithium ion battery could be. The, 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 uh, let's talk more about density like battery density, right? To make, uh, the way I understand it, the more high grade elements you're putting in into like a more confined space, uh, you're increasing the performance of the batteries um, and then as well as the range as well. So let's maybe like kind of talk around that for now. Yeah, absolutely. So when you buy your car, when I bought my car, I had a warranty attached to that battery in the car. Right. And it was something along the lines of if I drove 120,000 miles or I owned the battery for eight years, and there were any issues, I could take it back and get it fixed. The reason that that warranty exists is because customers care that they want their batteries to last a very long. And now customers want that battery to last even longer than they'd expected it to last in the past. So improving, once again, the chemistry improves the cell performance which improves the battery pack performance, which improves the car's performance, which can make sure that that battery lasts even longer than eight years and last 10 years, 12 years, 15 years. I'm expecting a point where in the future, somebody, when they buy their electric vehicle, after 10 years, will decide to hold on to their battery pack and they'll just replace the car body every 10 years. Oh, wow. Wait, that is not something I've heard talked about. So you're saying the true resource in your car Okay, so that kind of flips this on its head, right? Because when you think about Tesla, what gets us super fans and other people who love their Teslas buying all the time, it's the tech. So what you're saying is you will be wanting to buy the new tech, but keep your old battery. So that, I would be interesting to see what that business model looks like, because as I understand it, one of the most expensive parts of the car is the battery. Are you suggesting that we may be able to buy a car without a battery? because they're going to sell it to us and allow us to put our battery in. Like, do you think that, and then by the way, we don't have to talk about any brands in Pacific, but like, do you think that's going to be part of the future of electric vehicles? This is, this is the, this is my speculation on the future of the EV industry, industry. in general. Industry. Yeah. We're not talking about right? any company. Do you think this is going to be a thing? Yeah. Yeah. My, my, my speculation of the future of EVs in general is that when you go out and buy your EV, you're going to buy your car body and your battery as two separate purchases. They'll be bundled into one. But after 10 years, you'll want to hold on to your battery and you'll want to keep replacing your car body on top of whatever the latest model is. That's super interesting. That opens up a lot of questions. I mean, when you think about the way Tesla early on kind of did their cars up until recently, you were choosing a battery kilowatt that it was even separate from the features that it came with. And now Tesla did lock in certain features only for the performance cars to help justify the higher price point. But you're absolutely right. Their pricing model did kind of ultimately set up for this. 
So this is interesting because this is something you could never do with a gas car. You could never take your engine with you because the engine was made for the car that you were driving. And when you switch to an entirely yep. different brand or vehicle, there's almost no chance that engine would apply. And you know what? That engine depreciates over time. And it depreciates a lot faster than that the battery pack could ever depreciate. Wow. So do you expect there to be some new type of like IEEE standard for batteries so that manufacturers can sell like, so what you're saying is in the future, manufacturers will sell bodies and not the engines, which is by the way, if that becomes the case, that is a complete re like that makes, that makes automakers no longer having to deal with the challenges of either combustion or. Well, power. that's why automakers are going out and trying to partner up with battery companies. That's why automakers are looking at battery supply chains right now because they're so, seeing that this is the future. So and also saying, it's going to put a lot of stress on them to continuously keep innovating on the car body over time as well. So what you're saying is the future of automotive is battery. The future of automotive is battery. Oh my goodness. The future so, of automotive is the future of automotive is battery and it's autopilot. And autopilot is something that I think we can talk about for an hour and a half also. And one of yeah. my favorite subjects. I just like, I'm just realizing as you're talking that like the future of this revolution is that like, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now, we're not going to be talking about big oil. We're going to be talking about big battery. Yep. Yeah. So what about this million mile battery rumor that we've heard? Like what, I guess from what Tesla is doing today, what, what, what would need to change for our batteries to last a million miles? Like in layman's terms, at least, like, can you explain to somebody that doesn't understand it like me? I, I truly am curious. I never really thought about what that means. I've, Eli, you and I have heard about this, right? They're like, hey, a battery day, they may announce this million mile battery. Like, I don't understand what that means, though. Like, so, yeah, physically. there's a lot of stuff that's been leaking. Mainstream media is basically gearing up saying, I don't know where they're getting their information. I'm sure there's some truth to it. We'll know maybe in a month or three months, depending on how COVID goes. But yeah. I mean, they're talking about the show to a million mile battery. And by the way, that's assuming Tesla isn't making million mile batteries already. We just don't have enough users that can confirm that. But like, what would it that would have to substantially change in a battery from a chemistry standpoint, Vavos, that gives it longevity? The way to get a million mile battery is to make sure that your chemicals are at a high enough specification that they don't degrade, that they don't degrade really fast over the end of their life. So what I mean by that? There is actually a specific definition that battery engineers use for end of life. And the game is to extend the definition of end of life as long as possible. Now, here's the irony. Even when a battery reaches its technical end of life, it can still keep functioning. For a long time, because I work in a for number a of different time. technology fields. That, like, it's just it, that when it reaches end of mean... life, it degrades really fast in its performance. Right. So what is it that you have to do to a battery chemistry to substantially extend its end of life, right? Because there's obviously yeah. like out the engineers know, right? There's, they know that there's this thing that's holding them back. What is that thing? What is that marker? What is that? What is it? That thing is the fact that the chemicals that are used inside the battery cell degrade over time. That some of those impurities start interacting with each other and will start degrading that the materials, not the chemicals, but the materials also start degrading over time. So the emphasis has to be on the reliability of the materials in the cell to be able to last 10 times longer than they last today. So it sounds like there's two angles to this though too, right? So you can have more pure materials, but at a certain point at perfect purity, you know how to come at it from the other angle and say, how do we slow degradation? So what are some of the strategies that they take today to slow the degradation of these materials? Because obviously like that's a big part of longevity that maybe they could actually solve this with even the same materials by using other more advanced technologies like fill us in. Cause we don't, we don't even know what we're even asking here. Hmm. So I think it's, it's interesting to note that when any automaker looks at a battery, when, when any automaker looks at the battery that's in their vehicle, they're looking at it in terms of the pack. They're not looking at it in terms of the cell. And the pack has a bunch of cells that are performing independently from each other. So what's going to be just as important is controlling the way in which all of these different cells are interacting at the pack level in order to power the car and to reduce the strain on any individual cell or sets of cells so that all of them can degrade slowly over time rather than any individual pocket of cells being the ones that take the brunt and degrading really fast. 
So talk to me about Legacy Auto's approach to batteries, because just based upon their conversation, their coverage, and the performance they're getting from their batteries, my thought has got to be they are using entirely different thinking. Can you comment at all on what you've seen across industry and, and understanding of these different companies of the technology and how they're either doing a good job utilizing batteries and or a bad one? Because again, I just see a huge range in what type of performance people are like, getting out of the same batteries like, from the same manufacturers. A good example, I remember this scratching my head is I went to, Audi invited me to when they launched the e-tron and I started digging, like I started asking the salespeople there, okay, how, bag, how big of a battery pack is it? They said 90 kilowatt hours or something, right? But clearly the range that they're advertising is significantly different. It's much less than Tesla's. So is that density? Is it efficiency? Is it technology? Like why is it such a big disparity? And here's one of the other things too. The other manufacturers are setting gigantic gaps. They won't let you charge it even close to full versus like Tesla and the P100E Model S I have. They'll let me charge 100 out of 103 kilowatts. And the other cars, they'll let you get within just a hair of fully charged but these other manufacturers don't even let you get closer than 10% to full battery. So I'm like, what is it? What are they hedging against? Where's their technology failure that they are like, oh God, we have to limit range because there's something in this gap that we can't solve for that we're going to have limits. So like, what is it? What's the technology problem that they're failing to solve? Because this is a big delta that's growing. It's not de shrinking, it's growing. The technology failure is the battery management system at the pack level. So what does that mean? So what that means is why is somebody hedging that 10% of their battery cells can't be used? Because in a very crude sense, they're expecting that 10% of their battery cells will fail over time faster than everybody else. So wow. you're saying they know that they are bad at battery management. So they are limiting you early on. So you get an extended amount of time before you start to see failure. I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that they know they're bad. I'm not saying anybody's bad. I'm saying the engineering implication is if you're hedging that 10, like if, you're, if you are only allowing somebody to charge 90%, that means you're designing for a 10% failure rate. And so you're saying, all right, I guess I'm the, I'm the commentator, so I'm putting a value judgment on this. But from a pure engineering standpoint, what they're accounting for is a much larger failure point than other manufacturers are. So explain to us what goes into good battery management and what things you can do wrong that create bad battery management? Because this is something that like, you're gonna be educating me here. How do you and manage why? a battery well and what mistakes can you make that cause you to have a higher failure rate, like planning for 10%? Yeah, yeah why 90% why, why charge rate is the recommended amount? That's another thing I'm curious about. I've never, I just do it, but like it kind of goes in hand in hand with this question. Let us know what that is as well. So there's a, there's a sort of happy medium for or happy number for where you want to charge your battery cells so that they're not overextended. And it really depends on the type of cell, on the form factor and the chemistry, et cetera. For example, right now, I've got my car sitting on a supercharger or sitting on a, on a home-based wall charger. And I've programmed it to make sure it doesn't go over 50%. Why? It's because, because of COVID, I'm not gonna be able to drive my car for the next two months. But if I was using it every single day, I'd have it charged till about 85 or 90% and that's it. And that's because of the fact that that's what the manufacturing handbook told me was the happy number for this battery cell. Every other car will have a different sort of happy number. In terms of what goes into good battery management, once again, just like the game for good quality was about controlling the impurities, the game for good battery management is controlling the failures. It has nothing to do with the quality of the cells themselves, but figuring out how the cells can fail and how to mitigate those failures. How do cells so, fail? So how cells fail, the, the most frequent example it's talked about is, a, is an example, is the idea of thermal runaway, right? Which is really simplistic terms, battery gets too hot, it starts overheating, it starts overheating the other cells around it, and then all of them fail, or worse, there's a fire. Right. Yeah, that would right? be much worse. <laughs> so an easy way to think about this is, in case any of you use Google Chrome as your browser, what happens when one tab fails? The whole, all the tabs fail. The whole thing crashes. Well, that's what you don't want. Actually, in Google Chrome, if one tab fails, the tab fails, and you just close the tab. 
And yeah, the all of the other ones, fine. the other ones are fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Google other ones Chrome's, are fine, right? It's kind oh, of I must be principle. using. I must be using Internet Explorer. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Internet Exploder. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean that, that's how you want to think about the tabs are the cells and the browser is the pack. If any one individual cell fails, and fail is a very vast, wide term, right? Anywhere from the cell isn't able to charge to full, or the cell goes into thermal runaway. There's a huge swap in what can happen over there. So what's the difference in design that allows one pack to have a single cell fail in isolation, but in another pack, it creates a runaway where you start cascading and destroying cells around it. Like what's the difference that allows one to be resilient against that and another one that you just cause a chain reaction where you get a, you know, a very damaged chunk of your pack. There's a few differences. I would say one that comes to mind very quickly is battery management is done by software. And so it's the ability of the software to dynamically figure out which of the cells inside the pack can handle more than the other cells and allowing those cells to be the ones that power the car over the So you that. prevent the runaway from happening in the first place. That's what we're talking exactly. about. Exactly. Or you or you early detect when runaway could happen and shut down that individual cell before it can get into runaway. Okay, that's amazing. So really you're saying the problem is actually software more than it is hardware? No, the solution is software. Right, right. Sorry. This, the, but the reason why some manufacturers are having the problem, it's not because of their hardware. It's because they don't have software to manage it. Mm -hmm. Or the software hasn't learned enough. Right. Wow. Okay. So you know what? This does tie back into something that we know very well with autopilot. And I'm going to hold back from going too deep in the subject because we're going to have you back for another episode because clearly you and I are very passionate about that subject. Yeah. Is that being a software company is now a critical component of electric vehicle manufacturing. I'd love to get your high level feedback on how important you think software is to who wins and loses on this broader transition that we go from ice to electric vehicles. The, with software, there's this whole idea of network effects, right? With AI, there's a the whole idea of network effects, which means that, you know, the more, the more your software can learn, the better it becomes over time. The more your software interacts with other machines that have the same software, the better that all of them can coordinate and learn over time as a group as well. So the software part cannot be overlooked in its importance to determining who's going to win in automotive versus who's going to be left behind in automotive. And I would say it's just as important, if not even more important than the battery portion. So how important, if you say out of like five factors that are going to determine the success of future electric vehicle auto manufacturers from one to five, and we'll see, we're just not going to name the others. Where would you rank like a, fit, a pro proficiency in creating good software? From yeah, one I would to five scale, where do you put it? I mean, number one and two respectively would be software and batteries. The reason that batteries doesn't beat out software is because software in theory is infinitely scalable. Like the effects of software are infinitely scalable versus someday, unless there's a major technological leap forward in battery technology, we will reach the theoretical limit for what battery cells can cost. I think it's amazing that battery cells have become 10x cheaper in the last 10 years. Right? That is the reason why the electric vehicle revolution is happening. It's because battery cell costs have fallen so much. But they're not going to fall 10x more in the next 10 years. We're going to start reaching a limit for how much further battery cell costs can fall. But there will not be a limit for how much data can be collected by the software. What is, so there's the, main a lot of reason, what is the main reason in the last 10 years, exactly to your point, you said a 10x drop in price. It's like, I remember when I first started following Tesla early days, that per kilowatt hours, over a thousand dollars to produce it. Right. And now it's like, uh, at least Tesla is hovering around like over a hundred, like 120 per kilowatt hour. So that's, it is a 10 X drop. Is it just like mass production of this stuff? Is it technology related? How, how, would, how did we decrease the prices 10 X? Yeah. So like crazy. This, this actually deep dives really well into the work that I do with the team at benchmark minerals. So when the Tesla gigafactory was announced in 2014, there were, I think, only one or two battery factories in the world with over one gigawatt hour per year of production. And at the time that it was announced, it would single-handedly double the capacity of battery cells in the world. And that's when there was only 35 gigawatt hours announced. Today, there are something like over 130 
battery cell factories with a combined announced total of 2,400 gigawatt hours of battery cells that have been announced. So the industry has just gotten bigger and bigger in terms of scale. And with that scale comes the ability to push the costs of battery cells down even further and even faster. As the demand has grown, the supply has met the challenge and the supply has met the challenge through just forcing the price to go down as well. And it's a, it's a classic sort of technology price reduction curve that we've seen in lots of different industries in the past. iPhones, for example, were underpinned by the fact that memory became cheaper over time. And if you look at the curve for the price of memory, it looks not that dissimilar from the price of battery cells. Solar is another one that's talked about. If you look at the price of solar, you know, that also saw a 10x decrease within 10 years. And batteries is it, the latest. Is it, so true that giga, is it true that Gigafactory at one point, I guess the 35 giga, gigawatt hour production, that was equal to the entire like, world's production of lithium ion batteries? At I thought I read that, that somewhere. Announced. Okay. But now you're saying just in the last like four or five years, there's been a lot more like new production that's come online or, or plans for more lithium yeah. ion production. These are 2,400 gigawatt hours. Like that's crazy. Mm -hmm. But between at the, the time, between what Benchmark calls the mega factories, which are factories that are at or above one gigawatt hour per year of production, there's 2,400 gigawatts. And by the way, this isn't just announcements. 52 of these battery factories are already open and producing this year. So let me ask about a battery technology that like has all of the, you know, super battery geek and to a certain extent, the hippie community excited. What is your take on solid state batteries? And if or when do you expect we will see a technology comparable to that? Because a lot of people hail solid state as like the holy grail. So what do you, what do you fall on that subject? I don't mistake the people who hail it as the holy grail because if you look at performance on a lab basis, lithium ion is actually not the best battery for all the applications in which, in which it's being used. And yes, solid state can and probably will at a lab scale consistently beat lithium ion in a bunch of those applications. Problem is going back to what I said, there's 2,400 gigawatt hours of lithium ion battery cell capacity being announced today in these mega factories. So think about it from the business perspective. If you're the CEO, if you're the CFO of a major battery company, you've just announced a multi hundred million or a billion dollar investment into building multiple gigawatt hours of traditional lithium ion battery cell capacity, you're not gonna walk away from that immediately. You're gonna produce that technology and you're gonna let all of those lines depreciate before you start adopting new technologies or you start building a new factory. So solid state, the benchmark minerals sort of view on solid state is exciting technology, but lithium ion is here to stay. In terms of the arc of technology development, Lithium ion was invented during World War II, started to get commercialized 30 years ago. We are now here because of decades of technological progress with lithium ion at a large commercial scale. And solid state will have to go through some of that technological development to go from a lab scale to a pilot scale to a commercial scale um, before it can become a full industry scale solution. So solid state has a lot of years of commercialization. Okay, thank you for that perspective. That makes a lot of sense. Now I understand why people are so excited, right? Because like they see it in the research side and they see it to these amazing things, but you made a very good point. There's a big gap between the lab and going to full scale like terawatt production, which is what the world's gonna need by the time it gets there. I'm, there's I'm a absolutely- constant tension between technology and business, right? This is the same reason why a lot of legacy automakers may not be adopting EVs as fast as we would like them to, because they also have to deal with business realities of investments that they've made in internal combustion engines, in terms of the legacy automotive supply chain that they have before they can fully transition their fleets over to electric. Well, my mind is completely blown. Anwar Beck, what's, you gotta have a final question, because this has been well, like, I've been geeking out the last half an hour. <laughs> So back to solid state. So from what you're explaining, it seems like we're hot and heavy in like this experimental lab phase, right? So this commercial, if you had to guess, it doesn't seem like it's around the corner. It's not like in the next year or two that we might see it, like even a initial commercial application. We're talking maybe like 10 years out. Is that accurate? 
I think for a car company to go out and say, we're going to introduce a new model and this model is going to have solid state batteries. And for that model to be a big selling model, like a model three, it's going to be like 10 years. Okay. And if I'm wrong, you've got this on YouTube to hold me accountable. Yeah. So, so the last part of this conversation, I really want to do a deep dive. Uh, you guys know my, I've got good friends at ARK Invest, Kathy Wood, and these guys are brilliant. They do a lot of study in this EV autonomy space. So they, uh, and I followed them pretty closely. Back to this battery cost reduction thing that we've been talking about. You said 10x reduction in the last 10 years. A lot of that is Tesla, I feel like, leading the charge, building these massive gigafactories and things of that nature. So the difference between how I think the, the, the core thesis of a lot of the ARC study, at least with technology, is what they call Wright's Law. It's like, it's like a little bit of a different way to think about a Moore's Law. So Moore's Law typically, it's time-based, right? Your x-axis is, is uh, over time, things get progressively faster, doubly faster, and, and doubly cheaper. But according to Wright's Law, the x-axis changes to cumulative production instead of time. So the reason that battery costs have come down is why? Because Tesla is cranking out batteries and EVs, okay? So the, the current, uh, and ARC is a very bullish on Tesla. This is like one of their biggest positions. So, and uh, Tasha on their teams is like uh, her and Sam, they do a lot of study in this area. I think, I think you, you're familiar with them as well, but they have this uh, model that I think in 2018, Cumulative, we sold a little, like right around 2 million EVs annually, right? And then in 2019, it's estimated like 2.5 million. So nothing, like, nothing crazy at this point. Because I feel like every year we're selling over 100 million new cars, right? So relatively speaking, you're like one or two, EVs are still like one or 2% of the global production of new vehicles per year. But their model, even I'm starting to second guess, and I'm a big fan of Tesla. I'm a big bull. I think Tesla's going to crush it. But they are saying in the year 2025, so in like four or five years, that we'll be producing 37 million EVs. All right, let me share it. Uh, Voss, I think you need me to share that slide now, right? Yeah. All right, give me one second. I'll share it. Hold on. So while you're pulling up the slide, um, I got to say, I'm also you know, a huge fan of ARC's work. And what's interesting to note also in terms of what you said about the number of electric vehicles is last year, the number of electric vehicles, the number of electric vehicles sales grew by 20%. The overall auto sales globally fell by, I think it was eight or nine percent. So EVs are growing even if auto is sluggish, and they're gaining market share faster than we thought because of that. So major exponential growth curves always look linear in the beginning. I absolutely believe that we are just at the very beginning of the electric revolution. However, there are some fundamental limits that we're going to reach. So if you look at this chart, that's here on this page. And this comes from a presentation that I gave at Stanford University, which is a, a sort of a long, deep dive in the lithium-ion battery supply chain. And I did that on, on behalf of Benchmark. You can go look it up on YouTube if you'd like. It's a much more technical overview then than what we've done here today on this podcast. But on the left-hand side, what you see is you've got all of these steps that you have to take going from that lithium molecule coming out of a mine in Chile or in Australia or your nickel coming out of Australia or coming out of Indonesia, et cetera, going to chemicals, going to cathode, going to cells. All of these different parts of the supply chain take different amounts of time to build out. And they're all not congruent to each other. Because of the fact that there's so much excitement in the end of the supply chain with the cell manufacturing and the cars and not as much capital flowing to the top part of the supply chain, which is the mining portion, we're gonna have the problem that we see over here on the right-hand side. So this right-hand side is numbers that are prepared by the Benchmark Minerals Analyst Team on what is the supply versus the demand for lithium chemicals specifically. And we start to see that even if every single project that we project to succeed actually does succeed by 2029, we're gonna start seeing the supply chain break and there's not gonna be enough lithium chemicals that we need to reach the demand for the electric vehicles that we expect to see on the road solely based on what the car manufacturers are announcing. Well, I got a and real if question. you go to what you see on the left-hand side, which is that mining takes anywhere from 
five years is the absolute best case scenario to 25 years to do. We need to be making investments today in 2020 to solve this problem by 2029. Is it possible that we can solve some of our material resource problems of lithium by looking to space? Asteroids, the moon, other places? I'm just curious. I mean, you know, personally, like, no, all jokes aside, the company that I would love to start one day in the future is a space mining company. We should because, partner on that. Because <laughs> yeah, I'm in. I'll invest. Another, one, another way to look at this, if we were to come down to Earth, another way to look at this would be recycling. But... Recycling needs a large input feedstock of materials. And if you remember what I said earlier in this podcast, customers want to hold on to their batteries for longer and longer. So that input feedstock of batteries coming back for recycling may be pushed out further into the future. And so recycling can't make up for all of this. Once again, this is where autopilot and autonomy is really exciting because a lot of those demand numbers are based on our expectations for customers and consumers using cars today like they always have used them. And if you do have these fleets of robo taxis running around where you just don't need to make as many cars, then that demand could come down. But so it all remains to be seen. So let's talk about disruption, right? Because yep. the model that exists currently is based upon the assumption that we're gonna have to use relatively similar amounts of minerals of these different types as we are today. What type of modeling is being done to look at? Because like, again, obviously we don't know what we don't know and technologies that could come around, but we're make, it's, it seems like these models are making the assumption that we are using similar metals. Has there been any research sides on breakthroughs of things that they're starting to find that it's potentially this problem could be solved by using different resources, right? Because like one of the ways that industries often solve problems is if aluminum gets too expensive and they switch to steel, steel gets too expensive, they switch to, you know, something else, iron, whatever. I don't know. But like, have they, have, has any of the analysis looked at that problem to say that we may hit a point that we run out of these materials that will force industries to look at other materials and what materials they might look for? The reason that, the last slide showed lithium is because by definition it's in the name to have a lithium ion battery you need to have lithium so you could innovate away from nickel you could innovate away from graphite cobalt aluminum etc you can't innovate away from lithium the only way you can do that is by discarding lithium ion batteries or by just reducing your consumption so the supply meets demand for the latter part that could happen with autonomy so is lithium, is lithium in like abundance then? I mean, is that going to be the bottleneck in this EV revolution in like 20, 30 years? Are we going to run out of lithium? This is coming from somebody from the oil and gas business. All these resources are finite. This isn't infinite. But is there not enough lithium <laughs> reserves? Yeah, not, are there enough lithium reserves on Earth? It's not, it's not like dream about space mining and all this stuff. But like if we didn't go to though. space... <laughs> but if it if, yeah so if, if we there, keep it to earth, yeah the answer is look looking at it purely first principles there's a ton of lithium on earth it's everywhere it is in the air you are breathing right now the question is not is there enough lithium the question is can it be extracted economically and be made into that high quality chemical economically and the reason that you're seeing that divergence on the last page is the technology has not kept pace with the demand that's expected. At today's technology, you're gonna see that supply and demand dislocation. So we need a huge step forward in technology for extracting and converting lithium or nickel or cobalt, et cetera, into a high purity chemical so that we can close some of that gap. Is that really air you're breathing, Neo? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess my question for my, my final question for you or loss on this subject is when do you think the pressure on lithium supplies will get high enough that we will throw large amounts of money in research? Cause all these are technology problems, right? And when you say first yeah. principles and I'm going to look at this from a physics layer and say, unless something defies the laws of physics, these are problems that we can solve. Yeah. Obviously we can, and we will become exponentially more efficient at extracting, at extracting um, lithium from the environment. And so my question for you is, when do you think the pressure on lithium supply will get so great that we will spend enough money on the billions of dollars in research needed to start getting more efficient and start opening up new sources that we can extract lithium in a way that is actually cost effective? Like, what do you think the point is? Like, what year do you think we hit that point? 
it's already happening. So one of the initiatives I'm most involved with with Benchmark is conversations that we have with governments all over the world. And multiple governments that have these economic deposits of, of any of the battery materials, even just beyond lithium, are all looking at the battery supply chain as an opportunity for them to create jobs, to create revenue, to be the battery supply chain hub of whatever part of the world that they're in. So government pressure is doing part of the, part of the work to solve this challenge. But technology, there are interesting technology players. So for example, let's talk about Brian Lithium again. Two companies I really like to follow are Lilac Solutions and Energy X, which are both startup companies working on making lithium extraction better. Even beyond startup companies, even some of the legacy chemicals companies, and I'm talking about companies like your Dow or your Veolia, those types of companies that have been in chemicals for hundreds of years are also looking at how can we make the process of extracting materials of a high quality across the board, across the lithium supply chain, but also the industrial supply chain in general better. So as we have brought more and more attention to this idea, we as in the broader EV community has brought more attention to the fact that EVs are here to stay and everybody wants EVs. The governments, the companies, and the startups that are working on this have all come together to solve this problem now. But we still need more of it. So as part of what ARK Invest model includes is that they are, are, I mean, it seems like the only way for their model to actually happen is that they're predicting large advancements in the extraction technology to happen along in pace with the need to meet demand. Is that accurate? And we're back. That's a, that's a oh, good question for you. For is that for yeah. me? Oh, um, I bet that for Voss, actually. Like, I, so I don't know about the, the model, right? So that's why I want him to talk oh, about it. So, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so their model is and, basically and predicting. Maybe, uh, let, me, let me rephrase Eli's question because I, I was thinking about this as, as you, were, you were talking about all this is that delta is what worries me, right? Like that graph showed like production versus what we actually need. That looks like unless we figure out some like radical technology, you're talking about from a cost perspective too, right? Like I come from oil and gas industry. You guys remember the shale revolution that happened? We were thinking, oh my God, it's gonna get oil and gas business is the same. There's a certain cost associated to producing oil and natural gas. But then all of a sudden, and we thought there was a X amount of reserves, and all of a sudden we figured out if we frack shales, and all of a sudden overnight the amount of reserves of natural gas and oil like tripled, quadrupled. What worries me about this EV revolution is the chart that you showed, that delta between what we're going to need and what we're on pace to be producing right now. There's a huge gap. So in two, three years, let's say that chart you showed is exactly right. What are in the physical business world, commercially, what are we going to see? Like, uh, are people going to be constrained because of lack of raw resources to make batteries, hence the volume of EVs will be lower than what we're projecting so that it won't be quite as exponential as what Elon and everybody else is thinking because we literally will not have enough batteries to put into these cars. Is that what's going to happen? Or Either one or two things will happen. Either one or two things will happen. Three things, actually. So the first is that happens, that scenario happens, where demand outpaces supply and you're not going to have enough materials, so you're not going to have enough batteries, so you're not going to have enough cars. I think I speak for all of us when I say, I hope that doesn't happen. The second scenario that could happen is that companies keep charging ahead and they all keep competing for the small amount in comparison to their demand of the lithium supply that's available, in which case the price shoots up. The problem with that is that's gonna affect the battery cell price. And as we've talked about, it's very, very important to keep the battery prices cheap. And end so consumer, like our, we'll pay more for the cars in that scenario, right? Yeah, it depends on how much of a swing that happens, and it depends on the individual companies deciding. But they may decide to just, you know, push that forward to the customer themselves. Option number three is the vehicle companies can just decide that they are okay with using a lower grade of lithium. So they're with more impurities being in that lithium solution. That's going to affect the longevity of the battery cell. That's going to affect the performance of the battery packs over time. 
And so whereas you as a customer might be hoping for a battery pack that you own for 20, 30, 40 years and just keep changing the car body because the quality of the material isn't high, it just may not last that long anymore. Well, let's look but at that, Legacy Auto and their typical approach, right? Legacy Auto has a maintenance as a OE, as an operation and maintenance model. So I've always been concerned that they're going to be incentivized even right from the get-go to not give great batteries because their profits are based upon your car breaking down, right? Unlike Tesla, who's kind of broken through this mold and figured out that we can make a profit on the sale of the car and don't have to just live on maintenance alone. Like, it sounds like one of the risks are that the supply constraints may feed right into their business model. Is that, I mean, like these, I mean, I just say this because these, I mean, I mean, Ralph Nader exposed the heck out of them, right? The American cars were made to only last a hundred thousand miles. They were engineered obsolescence. Like what you're saying is that supply may actually allow them to have a kind of guilt-free excuse for engineered obsolescence. Is that, is that a fair, like, some, like that's, that's one way to, that's one way to look at it. I'm a cynic. So I do look at it that way, but go ahead. That's one way to look at it. Um, but the other way to look at it is to consider the consumer of an electric vehicle to be a more discerning consumer than an internal combustion engine vehicle. And when they sign up for the car, they might be signing up for the battery as well as the car. And they're going to want to know that the battery is performing at a high level. How long do you think it will tell. be until the consumer stops becoming discerning? And by basically I'm saying, when do you think it will become so mainstream that that's just what you do, right? Because you're absolutely right. Yeah. Right now, the consumer is discerning. Going to an EV is still like very much a direct educated choice because yep. what you do is you just don't go and buy an electric car. You buy a gas car. When do you see the tipping point hitting based upon your assessment of the industry today? When there are EVs that fit into the segments that majority of consumers buy at, such that they have a comparable choice between an EV and an internal combustion engine, and they're presented both choices and able to make a decision one way or the other for the segment that they want, not going in just to buy an electric vehicle. That's the point at which we're going to have this point at which, you know, people just don't care. What year do you think we're going to hit that based upon what you've seen so far today? Well, I think it'll happen definitely within the next decade. I think every single automaker in the world that know that wants to have a future has designed electric vehicles and has been very public about their goals of doing electrification. Once again, 2,400 plus gigawatt hours of lithium ion battery cell capacity because of the fact that they're expecting all of these, all these automakers to be using battery cells and making electric vehicles. It'll definitely happen within the next decade. There's a lot of other macroeconomic factors affecting exactly which year it'll happen. I mean, obviously like we're living through, you know, COVID craziness right now. So, you know, that may, that may push off some trends that might accelerate some other trends. So I'm not going to give an exact year, but no. the world of 2030 for automotive is going to be very different than the world for automotive in 2020. Let me summarize this last part of the discussion back with this uh, forecast that ARC made. From what I understand, and Vivis, you can explain if, if I'm off. What I understand is that the, what I mentioned, the 2 million cars in 18 and 2.5 and million roughly. I mean, I think we're in that ballpark. I thought I read somewhere that 80% of that production of EVs is happening in China, first of all, like a major, like a big chunk. It may not be exactly 80%. And the rest of the 20%, I believe Tesla by itself is like 16, 17% of the market cap or the, the percentage of uh, sales. And then the rest of the two, 3% is all these other traditional OEMs. What worries me most in this uh, 27, uh, $37 million model is I think Tesla will do this massive ramp and like, it, like they could be responsible for, for like 14, 15 million cars sold in five years. I don't doubt that. I could totally see China doing something similar as a nation, but I'm still very skeptical that the, like the Ford, uh, GM and Audi and all these other automakers, because I mean, Eli, you and I have seen this dude, we're seeing nothing but vaporware from these guys, right? They make these presentations. They're like, check out our car. And it's a PowerPoint presentation. There's nothing physical. They're not building plants. And like the only company that I know of like physically building a plant right now is Lucid Motors. And I believe Rivian is working on one, but like, because we're hearing a lot of talk. We've seen a lot of plans and you know what? We've seen a lot of vehicles get canceled. We've seen GM and Ford both cancel and delay a number of electric vehicles because they have to focus on profitability to COVID. So what do you see actually happening in the landscape and like how yeah. much commitment do you actually think Legacy Auto has to 
going Let's electric. Let's give a couple of examples to this, right, that are, that are very public examples. GM is partnering with LG Chem to do 30 gigawatt hours in Lordstown, Ohio. And CATL, which is a big Chinese company, is building a battery cell factory in Germany for both BMW and VW. And if I'm correct, Tesla is using CATL for their factory in uh, China, right? That's, that's one of the public suppliers that they've listed. Another, another good example of this is Northvolt, which is a Swedish battery company started by a bunch of ex-Tesla ex -Tesla folks, is working with the European automotive industry. And they raised about a billion dollars in their Series A. And the cornerstone investors included companies like VW and BMW. So these companies are recognizing that the battery cells and the battery packs are important. They're actually putting money behind it. And that's what matters, right? Like they've gone, but they've gone beyond that recognition to putting money behind it. So I'm very impressed with some of the companies that I see out there and the steps that they've taken. Obviously what matters next is that this money and this investment is translated into actually battery cells coming out and going into vehicles that consumers can purchase and use. I expect that will happen in the next couple of years as well. Let's finish this last part. Uh, with us. I'm interested. Let's forget everything we talked about in your head. If you had to speculate, what is the, in the year 2030? So a decade from now, what does this EV landscape look like? I mean, again, like, we're capturing this on YouTube, so in 10 years, we'll, go, we'll come back and see how off or how right you are. But what does it look like? We definitely, we can all three agree that it's, it's going to be very different than what we're seeing now. We're probably at the very beginning of this exponential ramp and all these things, but not even five years, 10 years out. What are things in your head? I mean, you're, this is like your specialty, your industry, you're with Benchmark. Like you guys are, this is your bread and butter. This is what you're studying every day. From what you understand, if you had to just kind of like speculate, what this industry could look like in 10 years, the EV space, what, what, what would you say? Because I, I think most, most of our listeners would be curious to see what an industry expert is thinking at this point. Yeah, I think lithium ion batteries would have reached their theoretical limit for cost of production within those 10 years. And at that point, you're not going to see huge cost improvements in lithium ion batteries anymore. Autopilot will become very sophisticated Autonomy software in general becomes so sophisticated because it's got a huge data corpus from which it's been continuously learning. And AI powered driving will be a reality for most people who own an electric vehicle as well. I don't think car ownership will be completely dead. I think that most families will still opt to own one car because just because like, when you have kids and you've got car seats and you've got like you want the, the assurance and security of having your own asset but car ownership in general will be heavily on the decline. And the companies that have won, the companies that still exist 10 years from now, are the companies that prioritize two important things, software and batteries. And, and I, I hope your little, uh, tr the, the idea that you talked about, about like changing out the fascia of your car, I think, I hope that happens. That would be amazing. Oh yeah, like and 10 base. years from now, I'll be taking yeah. my Model 3 in and getting a Model 4 or Model 5 or whatever and holding on to the Just same battery pack. it out. Yep. I, that would be amazing, dude. I really, I really hope that's the future that we're heading towards. Me as well. Eli, Eli, do you have any party questions? I was, we'll finish with Vivas asking us a, a few questions. No, I just got to say, this has been really insightful. And I'm really like, I actually, I could like the battery part, you drove home for me more than ever. I always knew battery is important. Like software is obviously key because like the whole world runs on it. But you've definitely given me a new appreciation of everything going on in batteries. And actually a little bit more that it sounds like Legacy Auto is actually putting a lot of the groundwork in. I think the problem is they're just so horrible at communicating and they come off so disingenuous that like for somebody who falls as closely and is used to Tesla, like anytime they come out and say something, they seem like they're completely full of shit. And especially as we see diesel gate and all these things continue to like recycle in the news and that they kept doing it after all these things, like it's hard to believe them, but if they're investing billions of dollars into battery manufacturing, it does seem probable that they are committed to an eventual future of doing this. I think just as a big fan of the electric vehicle revolution, it's just frustrating to not see it happening fast enough when we've watched Tesla do it from nothing. And we'd like to see these guys do it faster. So 
No, man, Vavas, I just want to say, man, thank you so much. This has been so insightful and thanks for all that you shared. I think a parting word that I'll say is one of my favorite ever Tesla reveals was the Powerwall presentation that happened in, I think it was March, 2016. And Elon had this, this line, which I thought was so poetic, where he said something along the lines of, this is a major global change. We're not going to be able to do it ourselves and we need other people to do along with us. I'm so happy to see legacy automotive companies going out and making the announcements and putting the money behind this because one company isn't going to be able to do this by itself. We're going to need a whole group of communities, a whole group, a whole group of companies to be doing this. And that's one thing I really appreciate about what you guys do, right? Is you guys are all about building the community for electric vehicles and spreading the awareness of the importance of electric vehicles. The more and more that we can get all people on board with the electric mission, from a consumer standpoint, from a supply chain standpoint, and even from the companies that are making these vehicles and making the batteries, the better the whole world will be. Vavas, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode of the Tesla Geek Show. Guys, if you're watching this and you have any questions, please submit them to us on Twitter. Vavas is on there as well at VavasVK7. He may even answer some of the questions that he's allowed. Vavas, thanks, brother, for joining us, man. It's been a true pleasure. And now we're going to start recording the bonus footage.